I'm Mark Halperin. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to Jeb Bush, if you knew then what we know now about what you knew we would know when we knew it, you never would have gone on Megyn Kelly in the first place. Happy National Crouton Day, sports fans. On the show tonight, questions, more questions, and not a lot of answers. But first, Jeb Bush is having another bad day on the question of Iraq. For some reason, he can't seem to answer a question that a lot of other Republicans have answered with great clarity. Would he have supported the invasion of Iraq knowing what he knows now? Let's review a brief history of the past 72 hours. On the subject of Iraq, yep. obviously very controversial, Knowing what we know now, would you have authorized the invasion? I would have, and so, so would have Hillary Clinton. I interpreted the question wrong, I guess. I was talking about, given what people knew then, would you have done it, rather than knowing what we know now? So in other words, if in 2020 hindsight, you would make a different decision? Yeah, I don't know what that decision would have been. That's a hypothetical, but the simple fact is mistakes were made, as they always are in life. I respect the question, but if we're going to get back into hypotheticals, I think it does a disservice for a lot of people that sacrificed a lot. Okay, Mark. Uh, Chris Christie, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, John Kasich, and a little bit Marco Rubio today all basically said, no, I, I think if we knew now, if, if we knew back then what we now know, no Iraq war. Wouldn't have been for it, wouldn't have proposed it, wouldn't have done it. Why is this guy, Jeb Bush Bush, having such a hard time coming down in the same place as all of his Republican rivals. He's looking horrible, and his supporters are getting a little freaked out about what's going on. I think it's two things. I think, one, it's psychological. He just doesn't want to be in the psychodrama of seeming to repudiate his brother. And two, I think it's practical. He doesn't want to get into this topic because then there'll be lots of questions about do you agree with your brother or not on specific things. Look, on one reading of the question, um, and there are various ways you can read this question, but on one reading of the question, which is literally, if you knew back then that there was no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, would you have invaded? The answer should be obviously no. I mean, I, it's not clear to me. Maybe Dick Cheney would say yes still, but not very many other people would say yes to that because that was the whole pretext for the war. How hard? I mean, this should not be hard for him. It, it shouldn't be. Although, again, there's a fuzziness to the questions to, to other people and to him. But he needs to get a decisive answer to this. And the fact that he gave the answer he gave to Handy yesterday and the answer he gave today, anyone outside his campaign would tell you these are bad answers. Two he needs better answers. Two things. He said, I'm my own man. There's going to be daylight between me and, me and my brother. This is a topic on which that should be true. And second, this is the single most anticipated question of the whole Jeb Bush campaign. He has to have a clear answer. He doesn't have it Let's yet. Let's wait for part four and see if he can get an answer that works. All right. The doctrine is in. In Marco Rubio's first major policy speech since he became an official presidential candidate, right up the block here at the Council on Foreign Relations, he talked about his own foreign policy doctrine. Listen to a little bit of Senator Rubio from just a little while ago. The first duty of the president, as written in the Constitution, is not taxer-in-chief or regulator-in-chief. It is commander-in-chief. Every presidential candidate must be prepared to execute this duty. So, John, I was there. He did a speech, Q&A with Charlie Rose, and then a Q&A with the audience. I didn't hear a lot there uh, that was specific or new. Uh, I didn't hear a lot that couldn't have been said by many other people. What's your main takeaway from that speech? Well, that's my main takeaway. First of all, the Rubio Doctrine consists of three main pillars, according to Marco Rubio. One, ensuring American strength around the world. Controversial. Two, two protecting the American economy in a globalized Deeply world. Deeply controversial. Yeah, apple pie, apple pie. And now comes cherry pie, preserving the moral clarity of America's core values. That is just vaporware, as far as I'm concerned. The Only the first one where he said he wanted to increase the defense budget. There's some specificity there. But the rest of it is just conservative vaporware. There were a few other specifics and uh, a lot of generalities and a lot of things, even though the, the sort of most energized part of the speech was criticism of Barack Obama, except for the criticism, a lot of things almost anyone in American foreign policy would say. I didn't think it was particularly well delivered either. And the room, I, I totally and the agree. room was not electrified. I think that, he, you know, for a guy who's getting high marks on foreign policy, very solid 
he answered Charlie Rose's questions quite well, but this was not a big speech that I think would instill in people a, a, a sense of this is our commander. This is the future. Yeah. Um, I thought he was better in the Q and A than he was in the in the no actually in the prepared speech, and I think he's moved to the right. That's the only thing you can say. He used to be thought of as kind of a moderate on foreign policy. This was a more conservative speech, at least in tone, if not substance. It was, it was fine, but it was not a game changer, as some people might call it. Wow. Such a thing. Uh, all right, in Congress, that trade deal that everyone's all head up about isn't dead after all. It looks as if the Senate is striking a deal, and there will be a vote tomorrow. So where is the standard bearer of the Democratic Party on this big issue? Now, I'm not talking about Barack Obama. I'm talking about the party's presumptive presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton. Washington Post editorial accuses her of making a, quote, dash for the tall grass on free trade, thereby, quote, missing an opportunity to help define the values of the party she would lead. And her own Albert Reinhold Hunt Jr., writing in Bloomberg View, says, quote, Hillary can't waffle on trade forever. Mark, uh, Hillary apparently thinks it's that not saying anything on this trade deal is good politics. Is she right? It's a lack of leadership. But I got to say, as I thought about it today and, and read what Al wrote, which I agree with, it may be this is the best thing for her. She's alienating both sides by not taking a position. But I think if she took a position, there would be a firestorm. Yeah. And by laying low and hoping the thing goes away, she, you know, the press doesn't like it. The Wall Street Journal doesn't like it. We don't like it. We think it's a lack of leadership. I know we both agree. But I think taking a position would be really politically dangerous for her. Well, look, I mean, there's someone in Al's column. He quotes an anonymous Democratic strategist who says that he thinks that she would lose, that Bernie Sanders would go up 20 points yeah. if she came out in favor of this agreement. I don't know if that's true. But there's no doubt that within her world, there is still a looming fear rational or not, of Elizabeth Warren getting in this race and the politics of that, no one around her at her highest levels of counsel wants her to give Elizabeth Warren any oxygen. And so I think it's bad on the substance, but probably smart on the politics. There's almost no doubt in my mind that she's for this deal. In her heart, was, in, in her, her heart, heart, in her head. In her head. As she, when she was Secretary of State, she was for it. So the question is, if she took that position, how bad it would be? Politically bad. What if she came out against? How bad would that be? That's my, my confusion. Why not come out against? She doesn't want to look disloyal to the president. Look, she doesn't want to look like a flip-flopper. She doesn't want to tie her hands as president. I don't know. But I think she's so tied in knots about it, obviously. Her staff won't even answer closest, about it. The closest analogy to this is the Iraq war vote in 2008, right? And they're reliving that again. Even with no Barack Obama in sight, she doesn't want to get have some issue that opens the door to a revolt on her left. Can you know, imagine how many Clinton World Conference calls there have been on this matter? Um, more, the, more, more than the many, number of many, spare many. ribs I've eaten in my lifetime. All right, so to recap today's episode so far, Hillary Clinton's in big trouble for not talking to the press. Jeb Bush is in bigger trouble for talking to the press and then there's another guy person number three scott walker is in some trouble for avoiding the media during his recent trip just concluded trip to israel so jeb bush's poll numbers are not looking great clinton and walker however are largely holding strong in national and key state polls so john while the media is up in arms over all three of them today to some extent what would you say, which would you say with the three, Walker, Bush, and Clinton, are doing the best job in dealing with the press right now? Well, I think the one that, that you have to grade this in some extent on consequence, and right now the person who's getting away with it is Scott Walker. Um, he's just, he's getting a, a free pass right now. Largely. There, there are people in his world who are trying to drum up more interest in the fact that he's not taking questions, but largely people in, speaking. People in Bush's world. In, uh, people in other people's world. Yeah. His, the world of his rivals, yeah. Bush primarily, but others, you know. He's, she's getting hammered for it. He's getting hammered by making mistakes, by Jeb. taking questions, Jeb Bush. Scott Walker, so far at least, getting off relatively scot-free. In the next a few days, I think Clinton will not be paying much of a price. Walker won't be paying much of a price. Bush is. The person I think is dealing with the best for his own purposes is Walker. He's not doing very much. In yeah. trip to Israel, there were some tweets and some photos. But Walker right now, many people consider the Iowa favorite in Iowa. Right. Many people look at his fundraising and think he'll be just fine. So I think Walker's probably got the best strategy. The question is, again, Long term, how does he do? And there's some degree to which, as the least experienced of the three, he may be setting himself for some danger and not taking questions in controlled situations right. right now. Well, he says he's going to come back and talk about the trips when he gets back. And so we'll then get maybe, to judge. Maybe slides. Yes, we'll get, get, to see, <laughs> get, to get to see how he does. I mean, look, I do think there is, with the Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush thing, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a calculation you got to make, right, which is this matters a lot in the echo chamber, but it doesn't matter a lot outside the echo chamber. You have long term 
consequences. But in the short term, no Americans are walking around in the malls of America saying, God, I wish Hillary Clinton would answer more questions. That's just not happening. Jeb Bush has done nothing since he started thinking about running trouble for president. For no, but he's done nothing in the last three days, arguably his worst three days of the campaign. The three days of he's the, taken. Of the he's meta campaign so far. So long. Yeah, because, because the people are unsettled by the fact that he doesn't know how to answer this question. Right. Well, and if Hillary Clinton were to answer questions and she didn't have good answers for her questions, people would be unsettled by that, too. My big thing that I can't figure out is, did he go into the Hannity interview thinking that was the right answer, or did he not execute? I have no, not good. I, I have no idea. Not good at all. All right, coming up, the spy who came in from the cold and into our studio. Mike Morell is next. Our guest tonight is basically Saul Berenson from Homeland, sort of. Former CIA acting director Mike Morell, whose new book, out now, The Great War of Our Time. Thank you for coming. The book's getting a lot of attention. You write about the Bush years and the Obama years and CIA's fight against radical extremism and a whole bunch more. Uh, and we're going to talk about that and, and some current stuff. But let me ask you first the great old author standby question, which is, why did you write the book? So really three reasons. Um, one is that um, I'm deeply concerned that this fight against Islamic extremism um, is going to be a generational fight. I think my grandkids um, are going to be fighting this fight. Um, and so I wanted Americans to understand what the threat is, and I wanted Americans to understand that we have to keep the pressure on these terrorists or we're going to get hit again. So that's the first reason. The second reason there is, is that there are a lot of myths out there about the CIA. You know, one myth is that, is that we do everything right. You know, it's just kind of the James Bond myth. There isn't a secret we can't steal and a plot we can't stop. Not true, right? This, the second myth is that everything we touch, fa you know, we fail at. It's kind of the get smart, Maxwell, the Maxwell smart myth, right? Um, that's not true. Right? And then, then the third myth is kind of the Jason Bourne myth, right? Which is that we're a rogue agency, that we do things the President of the United States doesn't know about, that the Congress doesn't know about. Well, that's not true, right? The reality is that the CIA is a bunch of incredibly hardworking, dedicated people trying to protect the country, and we get many things wrong, but we get, we get many things right, but we get some things wrong like any organization. And I wanted Americans to understand all that. And then the third reason is, is I happen to believe, and this sounds weird coming from former spy, that former senior officials have a responsibility to tell the American people what they did when they were in government. That this is a democracy and the American people need to know everybody's perspective on the decisions they made and the decisions they saw. I think that's really important. That's what, what, what you guys do every day. It's a great list. Countries kicking the tires on presidential candidates now. We are too. We want to kind of turn you into our political correspondent here on sure. foreign policy, national security. If, if you're looking at a candidate, Democrat or Republican, and trying to figure out, do they have what it takes to deal right. with crises, what are the two or three questions you want to ask them, say, about Putin? Yeah. So um, I would want them, right, to want to ask me questions about Putin. Right. I'd want them to, to understand that, that there's an organization called CIA where you go and you can find out anything you want about somebody. What I would want to know about a candidate in national security is, and I'm a George Shultz foreign policy guy, which is, you know, foreign policy, national security is pretty easy. Um, if you say what you're really thinking, right, you'd be very clear about what you think and about what you know, um, and you do what you say, right? You draw a red line, you follow through, um, and you carry a big, big stick. Okay, you know, so, so that's what I would want to know from the three candidates. Are you going to do those three things on national security? Well, what the, to take that to, to, to another, uh, to another hot spot in the world, what about Iran? So do you understand the big picture here? Because the nuclear issue, and this is what I would be doing if I was advising this president, right? The nuclear issue, really important that we get our arms around it and do something around it. But Iran poses a much greater threat to the United States than just the nuclear program. Iran conducts terrorism um, itself against other countries, uh, namely Israel, but also its neighbors, the rest of its neighbors. Um, it supports international terrorist groups, namely Hezbollah. Right? Hezbollah could not exist without the support it gets from Iran. It supports insurgencies throughout the Middle East, right? happening in Yemen right now. So I'd want to know 
do you understand the bigger picture here, right? And do you have a strategy not only to deal with the nuclear problem, but do you have a strategy to deal with the bigger challenge that Iran faces? I remember one of the most memorable speeches I ever heard in Washington was Pat Moynihan attacking the CIA for having missed the downfall of the Soviet Union. It seems to me that now that a similar kind of speech, if a guy like Pat Moynihan was around, could yeah. be given about the way that the CIA and the intelligence missed ISIS. Yeah. Um, what, what, is the, what explains that? How can the CIA miss something in both cases, but let's just stick with the current one, that big? And, and shouldn't Americans wonder whether the CIA is not, in fact, a little more Maxwell smartish? Yeah, than you so make I, it will out challenge, I will challenge the premise of your question, yeah. right? We didn't miss ISIS. We missed a small part of it, right? So, so as you know, ISIS started out as al-Qaeda in Iraq, right? And al-Qaeda in Iraq was at its nadir um, at the end of 2011 when we left. And we watched, as soon as we left, al-Qaeda in Iraq start to gain strength. And it gained strength for two reasons. One is the military and intelligence pressure that the United States helped apply was reduced. And two, Prime Minister Maliki started misbehaving and started alienating and disenfranchising Sunnis, and that fed al-Qaeda in Iraq. We reported all of that. Then al-Qaeda in Iraq goes across the border into Syria and becomes ISIS. They just changed their name. Same group. They just changed their name can't be al-Qaeda in Iraq fighting in Syria, right? So they changed their name. And we report their growing, their, their growing strength there. Why? They're getting recruits, they're getting weapons from Assad's arsenals, and they're getting money. And we're reporting all of that, right? The part we missed, the part we missed was the collapse of the Iraqi army in the face of essentially a terrorist group, right? The Iraqi army fell apart. We didn't see that coming. So that's the piece we got wrong, not the bigger piece. Well, a pretty big piece. A pretty big piece. Yeah. The man George W. Bush called Mikey. Yes. Author of the new book. And that George Tennant called something else that he can't say on the <laughs> air. Say, come on, we'll come on, just give us that yes. one. Come on. Rhymes with what? You can't say. Can't even say what it rhymes can't with. Can't even say, because wow. that would give it away. <laughs> wow. All right, we're going to get a thesaurus out after the show. The book again, The Great War of Our Time, Mike Merle former spy and now best-selling author B. Thanks for joining us. Great to be with you guys. And we'll be right back. Thanks. Yesterday, we learned that the Obama Presidential Library will be in the president's old stomping ground, Chicago. As it turns out, we had an expert on the Obama family in the studio recently, Peter Slevin, whose new book, Michelle Obama, A Life, is about Michelle Obama and her life. This is the first full-scale biography of Michelle Obama, the First Lady. She's obviously a historic First Lady. Um, you write in the book at one point that you, you, you write, I wanted to know what Michelle set out to accomplish and why. What did Michelle set out to accomplish and why? You know, it tracks back to who she was growing up and where she grew up. She grew up on the south side of Chicago where she saw inequality all the time. She sees it now. And what she's trying to do, I think, in the White House is, as I write about it in the book, to unstack the deck just a little bit. If you think about her programs together as a piece, there's, a, there's an element of sort of disadvantage, dealing with disadvantaged kids, disadvantaged adults, very much like what Barack Obama is doing today with My Brother's Keeper. Methodologically and attitudinally, how did you decide you could write a book about someone so covered and overcovered? and say new things. You know, like so many people we cover, we think we know them, but in fact we know the largely glossy campaign version of them. We haven't gone so deep. We kind of think we know it all and then we move on. And this was a great opportunity, especially in Chicago where I'm based, to go back into her history, her parents' history, and to see that in fact before she got to the White House, not only there was there Princeton and Harvard, which we know, she had a 20-year professional career with a very separate identity from Barack Obama. One of the things you decided to do, and I think um, that is a great virtue of this book, is not to focus as much on her time in the White House, um, although there is reporting on that there, but a lot of the richest stuff in the book is before she gets to the White House. Um, and you talk a lot over the course of, to, 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 of writing about her life, about her being kind of torn between two worlds, mm -hmm. both b between the black world that she was from and the white world that she came to inhabit, and also two different classes, right. black working class and, and the elite that she eventually joined. So talk about how those two tensions play out over her life and make her, made her who she is today. I think they were there pretty much as soon as she arrived at Princeton in 1981. She was a working class kid from the south side of Chicago. Chicago, when she was growing up, was still pretty darn segregated. It was before Harold Washington. 
And then when she went through Princeton and Harvard, got back to Chicago, she ended up walking in these different worlds. She spent 12 years, for example, at the University of Chicago, where she was trying to bridge this elite, largely white institution that had very tough, very negative relationships with the surrounding black communities. And her mission was to try to use the power that she had inside the institution to make things around in the surrounding neighborhoods just a little bit better, which I think is very much what she's trying to do now in the White House. Obviously, meeting Barack Obama was a big turning point, probably easy to argue, the turning point <clears throat> in her life. Pre-meeting Barack Obama, what's a turning point in her life that's significant? I think it was probably when she got out of South Shore, when she got out of Chicago, when she got to the Ivy League. She talks a little bit uh, about being lonely, feeling a bit like an outsider, largely um, you know, principally as an African-American woman, but also as a daughter of the working class. She gets to Princeton and she says she sees kids with BMWs. She said, I didn't know adults with BMWs. I think that stretched her in both places, Harvard and Princeton. There's been a persistent refrain throughout his political career among a lot of African-Americans that he is sort of not black enough or that he doesn't do enough for African-American voters. They confronted that sort of directly in the Senate campaign when he ran in 2004. And she spoke up on his behalf and basically came out and said, I'm as black as they come. He's married to me. He's black enough for you. Did she understand? I mean, that's a pretty hardball politi political thing. She's not a very political person, but that was playing racial politics in a very out front, kind of aggressive, bald way. Did she understand what she was doing as kind of na as nakedly political as at least I interpret it? I think she knew exactly what she was doing. And some of her strategists, as you all know, consider her to have possibly better political instincts than Barack Obama himself does. They had gone through the Bobby Rush campaign, you'll remember it was the congressional campaign where he lost to Bobby Rush uh, by 30 points. Fast forward a few years and people in, you know, who are on the south side of Chicago uh, who are political competing against Barack Obama say, hey, he's a kid from Harvard. What does he know? He, you know, worked as a community organizer and thinks he lived the civil rights uh, era. Michelle Obama says, listen, I know what this man is about. I know what he's prepared to do. I know what he has done. Let's not let's not play that card. Um, lots of talk that the Obamas may not go back to Chicago when they're done at the White House. They may move to this city, Gotham City, the Big Apple City, never sleeps. Right. City's so nice, they named it twice. <clears throat> Just not asking you to predict or speculate whether they will. But if they moved here, what do you think that would say about where she is in relationship to her, the city in which she grew up and where they made their political names? As you know, they've been telling their friends that they will move to New York after Sasha, their youngest daughter, finishes at Sidwell, France, assuming Sasha wants to stay there until she graduates. Um, I think part of it is that Chicago's not big enough for them anymore. She thinks she can be a little bit more anonymous here. There's certainly plenty of work to do on both on both fronts uh, in New York. Uh, that said, I think the fact that they're going to put the library, the presidential library in Chicago, the fact that her large family is still there, many of their closest friends are still there, suggests that they'll still stay tied to the of city. A, kind of a blow to people <clears throat> who would think the two of them would want to go back to that mm -hmm. city that nurtured them, right? I think the blow would have been if they hadn't put the library there. I think that would have been a, a lot of, that would have been seen as a betrayal. Yeah. The book again is Michelle Obama, A Life, and our thanks to Peter Slevin. When we come back, what Mike Morrell did before he worked at the CIA, way before, after this. Before our talk with Mike Morrell, he told us about the best job he ever had. Turns out he was a snack guy at the Cleveland Coliseum. Yeah, the guy who yells out, peanuts, pretzels. Can't imagine what that was like. Here you go. Popcorn here. Get your popcorn right here. <laughs> Remember, on TV, we're on twice a day at 5 and at 8. Until tomorrow, sayonara.